What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. Today, we're going to learn a little bit about two really important cellular organelles and this really interesting theory that attempts to explain where they originally came from. The organelles we're going to talk about are the chloroplast and the mitochondria, and they're important because of the roles they play in the energy transformations that support life on Earth. These two cells, the plant and the animal cells, are eukaryotic cells. As you can see, there are some differences between plant and animal cells, but overall, they are far more similar to one another than either one is to this prokaryotic cell over here. All eukaryotic cells have a nucleus that houses and protects the cell's genetic material. Eukaryotic cells are also bigger than prokaryotic cells, and most importantly for us today, eukaryotic cells contain membrane-bound organelles. That's what all of these little structures are inside. And it's the origin story of these two organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondria, that we're going to learn about today. Just like our body contains organs that do certain jobs, our cells contain organelles, and each organelle performs a function that helps to keep that cell alive and functioning. The mitochondria is the organelle where cellular respiration takes place, and the chloroplast is where photosynthesis takes place. These two chemical reactions are some of the most important that we will learn about all year, and I cannot overstate just how much life on our planet depends on these two processes. Photosynthesis, which takes place in the chloroplast, is an energy-absorbing chemical reaction. This is the process plants use to turn sunlight, inorganic carbon dioxide, and water into organic carbohydrates, simple sugars like glucose, and of course, oxygen gas. This is basically where food and breathable air come from, and this process is how carbon enters the base of the food chain. Cellular respiration, which takes place in the mitochondria, is an energy-releasing chemical reaction. This is how eukaryotes, plants, animals, and fungi, take those carbohydrates and transform the energy stored inside into ATP. If ATP molecules are the cell's rechargeable batteries, then cellular respiration is how those batteries get recharged. And our cells use ATP for everything from transporting and constructing molecules to sending chemical and electrical signals and even generating movement in our muscles. So basically, here's the big idea. Photosynthesis is how energy from the sun gets packaged into carbohydrate molecules and cellular respiration is how that energy is released from these molecules as they move through the food web. Here we can see the internal structure of a chloroplast with some of the most important parts labeled. This chloroplast has both an inner and an outer membrane surrounding it. Each of these coin-shaped structures inside is called a thylakoid, and they hold a pigment called chlorophyll that absorbs sunlight during photosynthesis. A stack of these thylakoids is called a granum, and the fluid-filled space between grana is called the stroma. Photosynthesis takes place partially in the thylakoid and partially in the stroma. In some ways, the internal structure of a mitochondria is similar. We can see an inner and an outer membrane, just like the chloroplast we saw. But instead of those coin-shaped structures, mitochondria have these elaborate folds called cristae and important parts of cellular respiration take place on this folded inner membrane. The fluid-filled space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix, and part of cellular respiration takes place here as well. This narrow region between the inner and the outer membrane is called the intermembrane space. Here we can see some more images of the intricate details of these fascinating organelles. These black and white images were captured with a transmission electron microscope, so these are real life images, not illustrations. And in them, we can see the folded inner membranes where photosynthesis and cellular respiration occur. But our best evidence suggests that these processes, cellular respiration and photosynthesis, existed on our planet well before the first eukaryotic cells existed, which is to say that cellular respiration and photosynthesis occurred long before there were actually mitochondria and chloroplasts. Our first evidence of photosynthesis is about 2.6 billion years ago, but we don't see that happening in a chloroplast until about a billion years later, which means that the first photosynthetic life forms weren't plants, they weren't even eukaryotes, 
they were bacteria, prokaryotic organisms without membrane-bound organelles. And here is where our story starts to get really interesting. Over a period of about a billion years or more, photosynthetic prokaryotes, called cyanobacteria, generated the oxygen gas that now makes up over 20% of our atmosphere, and upon which life on our planet depends. These single-celled organisms use the sun's energy to transform carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into organic carbon compounds and oxygen gas. Basically, they were making food and breathable air. Here, we see a few modern examples of cyanobacteria in both photos and illustrations. The products of photosynthesis, carbohydrates and oxygen gas, or food and breathable air if you'd rather, provided the means for aerobic bacteria to thrive on our planet more than 2 billion years ago. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen, but is capable of generating a huge amount of energy compared to anaerobic respiration, which can occur without oxygen. Cellular respiration became commonplace among living organisms on our planet once oxygen began to accumulate in the atmosphere, and has been the standard for life ever since, not just in bacteria, but in all eukaryotic cells that make up the plants, animals, and fungi that populate our biosphere. But bacteria were the first to do it, and in fact, they may be the reason that any of us can conduct cellular respiration at all. There's this theory that certain cellular organelles originate from a very ancient symbiotic relationship that was mutually beneficial to both of the cells involved. Endosymbiotic theory suggests that mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as free-living, independent organisms. They used to be bacterial cells living on their own, and at some point, they started living inside larger, more complex eukaryotic cells. After living this way for so long, they lost their ability to live on their own and are no longer independent organisms. Now, they are a part of the machinery of the cell, dividing and reproducing along with our cells and performing functions vital to sustaining life. In the early days of life, way before the first multicellular organisms inhabited Earth, some of these aerobic bacteria were enveloped by larger, eukaryotic cells. But instead of being broken down, these bacteria continued to live and function inside the larger cells. A mutually beneficial form of symbiosis arose, in which a single-celled organism actually lives inside another larger single-celled organism, providing that larger cell with energy in return for protection. Over millions of years of evolution, this aerobic bacterium became what we now think of as the mitochondria. And all cells originating from these original symbiotic cells contain mitochondria like these. Sometime later, a similar thing happened with photosynthetic cyanobacteria. These symbiotic cyanobacteria, enveloped by larger cells that already contained endosymbiotic mitochondria, evolved into the chloroplast that we know today. And the plants and algae that originated from this symbiosis all contain both chloroplasts like these and mitochondria like we talked about earlier. It might sound a little far-fetched at first, but there is a considerable amount of evidence that supports this theory. The first and possibly most compelling piece of evidence that supports this theory is that mitochondria and chloroplasts actually contain their own DNA. This DNA is distinct from the rest of the DNA contained in the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. More than that, this DNA is organized into circular chromosomes, just like the DNA inside of bacterial cells. The fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own distinct DNA supports the theory that they were once free-living organisms because all living organisms contain their own DNA. Another piece of evidence that supports this theory has to do with how mitochondria and chloroplasts divide and replicate themselves during cell division. Bacteria use a process called binary fission in order to divide and replicate themselves, as depicted here in this figure. When a eukaryotic cell prepares to divide, the mitochondria and chloroplasts inside 
divide and replicate themselves in a process very much like binary fission. It's very much like watching a bacterium divide from one into two, right down to how the DNA inside is replicated. And this process is quite a bit different than how the eukaryotic cells that contain these organelles divide. Since mitochondria and chloroplasts divide in much the same way that bacterial cells do, this supports the theory that they originated from bacteria and inherited this pattern of division from their distant, free-living ancestors. Another piece of evidence that supports this endosymbiotic theory that chloroplasts and mitochondria derived from once free-living bacteria is the fact that both of these organelles are surrounded by a double membrane, two lipid bilayers, separated by a narrow intermembrane space, much like bacteria living today. Functionally, this inner membrane is quite important to both organelles as they exist today because it provides a great deal of surface area, working space in which photosynthesis and cellular respiration can occur. But the original bacteria from whom chloroplasts and mitochondria have evolved also had this kind of double membrane, and many bacteria living today, called gram-negative bacteria, also have a double membrane that is quite similar. So it makes sense that both mitochondria and chloroplasts inherited their double membranes from their distant ancestors, who also had double membranes. The presence of double membranes in mitochondria and chloroplasts is distinct from the other organelles inside the cell as well, and distinguishes these organelles as unique from the others. To better understand the processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, it is good for us to know something about the organelles in which these chemical reactions take place. And the story of chloroplasts and mitochondria is, I think, a pretty interesting one. One that started over two billion years ago as a mutually beneficial relationship between a couple of very different cells. Definitely something to think about. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, everyone.